Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 260 is with Josie Duffy Rice from the podcast Unreformed. I'm good. Thank you for having me. I got to ask the question, how did you happen to come across a story like this? And where, what did you feel in your heart to say, you know what? We need to bring this story forward, but it has to be done so because I have to do some homework. Yeah, thank you for asking. It, I, I actually found out about it from um, the producer of the show who was really kind of starting to think about what this could look like and reached out to me about the school. And I was really shocked. I had never heard of this institution. Right. You know, I'm in Georgia. I do a lot of work around this issue and I had never heard of Mount Megs. And that really I was immediately felt like this was a story I wanted to be part of. Is it a story that history wanted to try to hide? And then all of a sudden, I mean, it's, I mean, it's like kudzu in Fort Mill, South Carolina. There's a lot of history underneath that kudzu. If you go in there and you start right. digging. Right. You know, I, I think that I think that I don't know if they actively wanted to try to hide it or people just didn't care. You know, it's hard sometimes to, to tell these stories. The state of Alabama wasn't keeping great records. Nobody was checking up on these kids. Mm-hmm. Really, the story was one of mostly hearsay, right, um, at first, before we started to really uncover some some corroborating evidence. And so um, I, I, I but it's it's absolutely true that for years, the survivors of this school went without being able to talk about this with anybody, including their families. Well, um, and so this is really the first time this is really all coming to light. One of the things that, that you display on, on the podcast is the fact that you, you it goes beyond just storytelling. I can hear your passion, your emotions. I mean, this, there, there's a connection here to this story for you that that I mean, it's a, and I think people, the, the average listener will go, dang, man, she really was using this as a calling. Mm, uh, yeah, I, I'm glad to hear that that translated because it felt like a calling to me. And I really wanted to honor the stories of people who were willing to share with me. Many of the people I talked to are now in their late 60s, early 70s. They went to the school in the 1960s um, and it's been haunting them ever since. Yep. Um, you know, and so um, they were so gracious with their memories. Um, and this story changed me. I mean, this this. This uh, this pro- this project has been one of the most meaningful things I've ever done. So um, I definitely felt that way when they're holding on to such a haunting inside their soul for so long. And, and you get to talk to them. What what do you say in order to bring it out? Because something hasn't brought it out before. But now, I mean, there they there you are with them in this moment. Yeah, you know, there is something about this, which is power in numbers. Mm -hmm. When we were able to find other people who went to the institution, when we were able to uncover, you know, uh, depositions from 30 years ago where uh, more than 30 people talked about their experiences there, what it told, what it said to the people that we were interviewing was someone else remembers this too. It wasn't just you. There are other people who are still, you know, suffering from this, who have, who still have nightmares, who still have these dreams. And that really allowed people to speak up. So, you know, I'd love to think that a lot of it was, you know, me, but I think a lot more of it was this sense of community, this ability for people to, um, to understand that there were, there were, there were people out there who, uh, who had the same experience that they did. Do you look at this history? And try to see if it could happen again here in this history that we're, we're presently living, because there are so many different private schools and charter schools and and, and mm-hmm. schools in, in, in areas that really don't play by the same rules as everybody else. But we don't know what's going on behind those four walls. I think that's exactly right. I think that Mount Megs, um, which is what the Alabama Industrial School for Negro Children uh, is now called, Mount Megs is still open. Mm. Okay, it's still open today. I don't think uh, it's as bad as it was, but I don't know what it's like inside there because, like you said, we couldn't get inside. Um, You've seen maybe nationally over the past couple of years, a lot of reckonings at these schools, not just these schools from the 1960s or the 1940s or the 1920s, but schools from today where kids have experienced enormous abuse, Mm -hmm. enormous mental, emotional, physical and sexual abuse. So I think you're exactly right that this is not just a past story. It is a present story as well. Oh my God! You just you you must be reading the Charlotte Observer today because they they found a, a coach that was uh, was was oh, was abusing people. I mean, I just oh my I God! You just that. you just opened up that wound. Oh my gosh! I didn't know that. I'm gonna have to look that up. There was just a story earlier last month. I'm sorry about a school in Missouri uh, that a lot of it echoed what I found at Mount Meg. So I think that's you know it's there. It's so hard to think about how many kids went to institutions that abused them you know, across the spectrum. Um, 
and and how that is still happening for sh- absolutely that's still happening today. This is not a bash against the millennials, Generation Z, or the new Alpha generation, but I mean, but but you talk about the Jim Crow era in this, and I and I, I love it when you do things like that because they've got to never forget this that 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 this yeah. was an era of change and challenge, but it cannot be forgotten. Exactly, exactly. And look, my grandmother is ninety three years old. She grew up in Texas. Um, and she has more yesterdays than she does tomorrows. Um, and once she's gone, that's a whole generation of history that is gone, a generation that isn't that that far away, but people tend to have short memories. So I think it's part of, um, you know, our mandate as journalists um, uh, to be able to tell not just what's happening today, but how that connects to what happened yesterday, how that connects to what happened 50, 100 200 years ago, Um, you know, they say if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's all of our responsibility to hope that doesn't happen. And isn't that weird as journalists and as writers that that we're so attracted to content and stories? It's like it's like that. That's our mission in in, in the performance or the calling is that we don't want to forget history. And we and we use our voices to to say, hey, look, hey, 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 I'm seeing something over here. Yeah, absolutely. I think that. Um, I think that really is it ha- is so much of the reason that I got into this field. And I think it's also because you see that people throughout time have some of the same tendencies, have some of the same instincts um, and our ability to kind of grapple with those and even reel them in is so key to our ability to evolve. And I really wanted to be able to talk about the hard parts and also the 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 beautiful parts right because mm-hmm. some of the story is beautiful Man, you talked about how how history repeats itself and stuff. And, you know, through Buddhism and stuff like that, we're taught, you know, that, you know, we just live this life over and over. And so when I see things starting to happen over and over again, I'm going, what the hell? How How is this I even know. possible? Is this the rebirth of somebody and they just they're they're back to correct it? Right. Yeah, it, it can. So it, it so often feels like that. And to me, it also feels like people feel like they're experiencing something for the first time yeah. because we're not very good at telling, you know, talking about the past. We're not very good at um, teaching these stories. So I, I do think that, you know, the heart arc of history, I hope it, you know, brings towards justice, but it only bends towards justice if we talk about um, if we talk about the failures of our past. In a very blessed way, in order to heal the history of the South, because, you know, we've got a big reputation down here. Don't don't we, sure we have do. to un- uncover those things that help create this history? Get it out there to have a conversation so it can heal properly. I think that's right. And the reason I think that's right is because it's important for us to recognize that good people can make do terrible things, that institutions can incentivize really terrible behavior. Right. Um, and that. um People made mistakes in some ways in order so that we don't have to. Uh, grappling with history, it's really a blessing. It's not a curse. Um, so many, you know, it's such a it's such an amazing to be able to look through archives and find information about Mount Megs, to be able to talk to survivors from it. I mean, I find that to be so lucky, ultimately. And um, for people who are trying to avoid teaching that history, for people who think that their kids learning about that history is wrong or, you know, hurts them or um, is is bad for the country, I, I couldn't disagree more. I think it's good for the country to see where we were, yeah. Yeah. where we could go and where and who we could be. As you're digging in that information, do you find yourself in the, there's, there, there seems to be a, a mental sickness with leaders in the way that I have the power, you must do as I say, and, and or else. And it, it just, I mean, from from being a coach to martial arts to schools and things who if you're ever given power, it always seems like they're going down because something happened. Yeah. You know, I think um, I think that that is true for a lot of people, certainly not everybody, but a lot of people. And I think it's especially true at um, institutions like Mount Megs, because not only are they children and seen as kind of helpless and yeah. um Silly influence, but they were also considered "quote unquote" bad children. And I'd like you know to point out that for a lot of these kids, they were sent to Mount Megs for missing curfew, for skipping school. They were not sent to Mount Megs for some sort of horrible, horrible action, right? But they were considered bad kids. And when we deem people as bad as evil, we are so much more willing to mistreat them, even children. Mm-hmm. And you can really see that 
there and at this institution. Mary Stevens, did she keep a journal? Because I mean, somewhere along the line, she had to have the confidence to reach out and start sharing some stories. You know, she didn't keep a journal. Wow. She had those stories in her head and she um, she felt moved in 1968. She ran away uh, with four other girls. She was caught by the police. Um, she was taken to the juvenile detention center where she would most certainly be sent back to Mount Megs. Uh, she was not the first or a hundredth person to run away from the institution. But when she walked into that detention center, she said, I need to talk to someone. I need to tell them what's happening to these to, to us there. Um, and that changed that changed the future of Mount Megs. It changed everything. She uh, ended up telling Denny Abbott, who was a white juvenile probation officer, he risked a lo- you know his whole life and well-being to kind of help these kids. Um, and and it really, you know, what she was able to recall, I think not only did she not need a journal then to remember it, but she doesn't need a journal now to remember it. They went through some things that I don't think they can ever forget. When you're opening up a story like this and you're starting to get sound bites, word gets around that, uh, oh, oh, Josie's up to something. Has somebody approached you and looked at you and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? No, you know, I, I mean, I, I think that, well, Mount Megs <laughs> has not wanted to let me in the doors. I can say that. <laughs> I don't think the state of Alabama is too thrilled with me right now. Um, but in general, people have been which I think in some ways is almost equally disconcerting, which is that they, they're they shocked. The people who live in Montgomery are shocked, right? People who, you know, live down the street from Mount Megs are shocked to know what was happening there and what could still be happening there because, again, this institution is still open. Um, I, I think, like, what I, have, what I have been met with mostly is gratitude from people who went there who never got to talk about this with anybody and are just relieved that there, you know, are other people, other survivors that they can now kind of create more community with. You, you've you've worn the jacket that says I am a journalist, but at the same time, the, in listening to the podcast, I go, oh my god, no, no, she's an activator. She she's informing and she's activating hearts. That's so nice. I appreciate that, and I um, you know, I I hope that this activates people. I hope this activates people to look in their own towns and cities and ask, like, what institutions are here, right? What schools are here? Where do the juveniles get sent? How are we treating children? How are we treating black children? I really hope that this brings people to at least ask some questions, um, um, because the you know if the the reason people get away with stuff like this especially now. Back then, a lot of the reason they got away with it is because it was Alabama in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Now, I hope that Alabama is a little bit better than it once was, but um, people get away with what they're able to hide. And so this is kind of the mandate of journalism, right? To try to bring everything to the surface. Oh, and that yeah. is what I'm trying to do. Oh, yeah. Back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, if, you know, newspapers became that little thing that you had to go to the library to p- look up on the film and then, or, and then, right. and then they would bury a news story in, in television. These days with podcasters, you're actually talking to 2035, 2055 and up. Yeah. I think it is um, kind of amazing the reach. But I also would say what I'm also finding is that back then we, we had, better funded local journalism. Yep. And so now I think even for people and papers in the Alabama area, which are doing so, so much, so many good things with what they have, they have a lot less. Right. And this is what happens also when we let um, when we watch journalism, local journalism get defunded, basically fall apart. The stories like Mount Meg's, who's going to tell them if we don't fund journalism, if we don't, you know, um, if we don't actually see as our own community that this is part of democracy. This is part of accountability. The timing, the pausing, only because I'm a producer as well, is is that you've got to know where in the story, the recorded interview, where is the story, how to present the story, and where in the podcast do I put it so that I still have that continuing of, of of a listener, that continuation of them being there for the next episode. Yeah, well, I have to say, we had such an incredible team. Uh, the School of Humans team, the iHeart team, Gabby Watts, our producer, was incredible and really was able to um, kind of p- put this story together to make the puzzle pieces fit. Uh, it, You know, we went through a lot of drafts of this story. We took out 
a lot of stuff. We took out some of the hardest parts because we want this to be bearable for people to listen to. But we also wanted to really accurately tell what happened to these kids. And Gabby especially was able to do that so masterfully. I'm glad you brought up iHeart because I'll, I'll tell you what, a, a lot of history that has been lost here is that I was there when Robert Pittman, Bob Pittman said that there's this new thing we're doing and we're going to call it iHeart. And, and it's like, we're going to, we're going to build it. And to see how they are so incredibly in touch with the depth of history, as well as everything growing forward is this, I'm so proud of what, the, what they're doing with real people. Absolutely. I think, you know, this was a, this is a hard story to get behind, right? You really have to take a leap of faith to say, yeah, let's try to tell this. Let's try to make this a project. Let's, you know, let's, let's spend some time on this story. And I am, I, I cannot express my gratitude. Um, among iHeart, among uh, the production partner, School of Humans, again, among the producer, that they were willing to invest in this because I'm, I really hope it will change the lives, at least of survivors of that institution. As a writer, you know, they it digs inside your soul. How many times have you sat on that computer, your fingers stop and your eyes are filled with water? Yeah, I mean, I've, yeah. I mean, the emotional impact of this on on my own psyche has been major. Um, it has been some of the stuff I've heard I will never forget. And I have, like you said, cried many a night telling this story. But I've also found a lot of hope in it, a lot of joy, a lot of pride in the people who um, continue to survive, who continue to understand, uh, try to grapple with what happened to them and who try, you know, to be better for their kids, for their families, for the people that they interact with. Um, and so it is in many ways a, a sad story, but ultimately I came away from it feeling hopeful about the human condition, if I, if you can believe that. Um, because I think that there's always space for change. There's always space for people to reflect on the choices they've made and try to make better ones. And that's kind of the incredible thing about, you know, trying to track history. Oh, I love where your heart is. I hope other schools listen to this and realize it's time for Josie to tell our story as well, because we got to get it out there. Thank you so much. I am, am really grateful and I'm really grateful for you for listening and, and trying to, you know, spread the word. Absolutely. Please come back to this show anytime in the future. I know there's a lot more in you and we're going to talk many more times. I love to. Thank you so much. You'd be brilliant today. Okay. Thank you.